I think it has been really a very interesting and exciting session. We have time for a five or a minutes of discussion, I think, though we are late, but it's not so late. So I, I will invite all the speakers to the table and, and let's see if there are some uh, questions from the audience. The good news is that the bad news is that we'll have to work a lot because there are many new things coming. The good news is that we will be busy for, for, for some time before we clarify the role of all these new technologies. So that's uh, it's really very exciting, all developments. Is there any question from, from the audience? I would like to start with a question, and which okay. if you allow me. Uh, this is a, qu a question for Dr. Kaufner. And uh, in this, uh, with, uh, within a perspective, of course, the um, benefit, uh, which will be the patient who will benefit most from intracardiac echo? Which is the key point for intracardiac echo? Well, I think uh, all patients with complex ablation procedure will benefit, but mostly, we, uh, I, I, if I could range it, uh, I would start with congenital heart disease, where I, I think it's absolutely essential because you, it gives you a lot of uh, feedback where you ablate in this uh, strange anatomy. Then patients with uh, some specific uh, substrates like uh, uh, idiopathic VT from uh, aortic or pulmonary cusp region, that's mm -hmm. another uh, arena. And you can use it also in, in AFib patients, as I showed you, because it, it, it really goes beyond, far beyond uh, transeptal puncture safety. It, it uh, really gives you immediate feedback all the time. So I believe that with the development of uh, ECHO, uh, we can uh, we probably may may drop uh, really the 3D mapping system and be able to to monitor uh, and even reconstruct the the chamber geometry uh, with a 3D echo maybe with a sensor that can be located in a space like uh, MPS or other systems. Are you keen also on the objectivation of the lesion? How uh, can you uh, make objective uh, the, the ablative lesion? You see that no, the, this is another uh, very interesting uh, uh, sphere uh, of development, and I, I, I also believe that this is uh, this is a way because then you can assess what is the lesion depth much better than uh, just contact force measurement because contact force has limitations. I, I think we cannot uh, uh, overcome these limitations just uh, having a contact uh, detection, but we want to see what is going on in the tissue. So this is another very uh, interesting area. You are right. One, it's, uh, one question for Michelle, and I think also uh, it, re it also is related to Mr. Kim in, in the sense that the concept of the disease of the scar in the atrium probably is completely different of what we are looking in the ventricle. And uh, you show that it's more organized within the scar, and, uh, the cafes indeed are the, the, the healthy tissue. So how do you think all this information is gonna be translated into practice? I mean, should we focus again, knowing that uh, cafes it's the surviving good tissue, let's say more or less, uh, how do you, Thing that, that all this information about the scar can guide the, the, the ablation process? Um, uh, in fact, we, we are using two different algorithms uh, the one developed by Marouche, Salt Lake City, and the one developed by Reza Rezavi. And we have access to the algorithm and we can try to, to modify uh, some of the system. Uh, now, I'm uh, we are working with Steve about uh, the relationship with electrograms. We still don't know uh, what will be the, the practical implication. Uh, we have to work more on uh, all the issue between the electrograms and uh, uh, the delayed enhancement, but probably we will find in uh, one or two years uh, the place of this type of substrate imaging uh, for the strategy of ablation. Uh, for now, the second thing is we need structural plus uh, electrical function and electrical mapping. And it's clear that what we have seen for the valve, uh, for everything, for the PTCA, uh, I think we will move in the future more and more for the non-invasive uh, mapping of arrhythmia, possibly also mapping the QRS and the QT uh, to predict uh, um, 
to predict, for example, the risk of sudden death much more precisely than we do with the QRS. And like uh, Angelo said also for CRT, uh, we are looking at the QRS when we can now have an access to the 3D mapping. And uh, every time you move your catheter for CRT, you will see a change. So for the substrate imaging, I still don't know. But probably we will have some patient with a compact scar that is already one information. And the second thing is uh, uh, integrate this with all the electrical mapping. And you have seen that uh, when we have looked at these uh, uh, rotors, we were using a system named fa phase mapping, which is in terms of engineering uh, something, uh, a complete different algorithm than what we do for activation mapping. And when we ask to the engineer, uh, can you show the electrograms corresponding to this uh, rotating wave? We were looking the way we are in terms of activation mapping, in terms of morphology mapping. And this is a way to validate. So this is preliminary, but I think that we will be able to do a lot of things from uh, outside. Good news. <laughs> yeah. The cardiology is not a static discipline. Eh? No, not, a, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Do we have time for one more question? Or so? Well, I, I would like to make a question to Dr. Auricchio. Um, just to um, monitor your uh, CRT procedure, uh, will you go to hemodynamic uh, measurements for improvement, or just electrical activation will do the, the same? Um, I would say, as of now, I think um, if you have a patient with a cure restoration above 150 or probably with a left, typical left penetration block, you don't need anything. You just go in and you can do uh, the implantation um, in the best way, in the most conventional way. Different is when we are talking about um, the in diffuse intraventricular conduction disturbances, because then I think um, ECHO may not be the uh, ultimate solution. I think we have to go back into the electrical understanding of the electrical disease, having a better understanding of electric diffusion, you can use either surface uh, mapping as Michelle was showing, or you can do more detailed analysis of the, uh, uh, um, by using standard electrical activation. And the problem with, with that, with the acute mapping is, um, or with the hemodynamic result, is the fact that most commonly acute hemodynamic results do not 100% predict the outcome of the patient. So that is where we have a mismatch. But I am convinced that if you are able to make a good understanding of the electrical diseases and you try to minimize the dispersion of your electrical activation, um, then you are in a, in, a, in a good way. So it may probably that the mechanical part will follow because it would be quite intuitive. What we don't understand so far is, and this is also part of our work now, is um, when we look at an ECG, we think that an ECG is just um, delay activation. But we do not account is the uncoupling, cell to cell uncoupling. Because the cell and cell uncoupling may be the one uh, who, so when you're losing connection, is the one who were really, even if you deliver properly the therapy, you don't get the response because you don't have a perfect, uh, you can have enough cell-to-cell uh, uh, -cell, uh, coupling. And this is really a great area of interest because if we are able to identify those patients, these are probably really the one who have really the, uh, who have really an option, and then you have to move immediately to mechanical solution rather than to play around with any other electrical therapy. I think we, we have to close. We can keep uh, talking about it for hours, but uh, we have to leave, unfortunately. Uh, we would like to really thank our uh, invite, uh, invite these uh, people uh, b b for their contribution. It's been really very, very interesting, and uh, the audience for the patients. And uh, you can go for lunch now. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>